Roughing It by Mark Twain, Chapter Two. The first thing we did on that glad evening that landed us at St. Joseph was to hunt up the stage office and pay a hundred and fifty dollars apiece for tickets per overland coach to Carson City, Nevada. The next morning, bright and early, we took a hasty breakfast and hurried to the starting place. Then an inconvenience presented itself which we had not properly appreciated before, namely, that one cannot make a heavy traveling trunk stand for twenty-five pounds of baggage, because it weighs a good deal more. But that was all we could take, twenty-five pounds each. So we had to snatch our trunk open, and make a selection in a good deal of a hurry. We put our lawful twenty-five pounds apiece all in one valise, and shipped the trunks back to St. Louis again. It was a sad parting for now we had no swallow-tail coats and white kid gloves to wear at Pawnee receptions in the Rocky Mountains, and no stove-pipe hats, nor patent leather boots, nor anything else necessary to make life calm and peaceful. We were reduced to a war-footing. Each of us put on a rough, heavy suit of clothing, woolen army shirt, and stogie boots included and into the valise we crowded a few white shirts, some underclothing, and such things. My brother, the secretary, took along about four pounds of United States statutes, and six pounds of unabridged dictionary, for we did not know, poor innocents, that such things could be bought in San Francisco on one day, and received in Carson City the next. I was armed to the teeth with a pitiful little Smith & Wesson seven-shooter, which carried a ball like a homeopathic pill and it took the whole seven to make a dose for an adult. But I thought it was grand. It appeared to me to be a dangerous weapon. It only had one fault. You could not hit anything with it. One of our conductors practiced while on a cow with it, and as long as she stood still and behaved herself, she was safe. But as soon as she went to moving about, and he got to shooting at other things, she came to grief. The secretary had a small-sized Colt's revolver strapped around him for protection against the Indians, and, to guard against accidents, he carried it uncapped. Mr. George Bemis was dismally formidable. George Bemis was our fellow-traveller. We had never seen him before. He wore in his belt an old original Allen revolver, such as irreverent people called a pepper-box. Simply drawing the trigger back, cocked and fired the pistol. As the trigger came back, the hammer would begin to rise and the barrel to turn over, and presently down would drop the hammer and away would speed the ball. To aim along the turning barrel and hit the thing aimed at was a feat which was probably never done with an Allen in the world. But George's was a reliable weapon, nevertheless, because, as one of the stage drivers afterwards said, if she didn't get what she went after, she would fetch something else and so she did. She went after a deuce of spades nailed against a tree once, and fetched a mule standing about thirty yards to the left of it. Bemis did not want the mule, but the owner came out with a double-barreled shotgun and persuaded him to buy it, anyhow. It was a cheerful weapon, the Allen. Sometimes all its six barrels would go off at once, and then there was no safe place in all the region round about, but behind it. We took two or three blankets for protection against frosty weather in the mountains. In the matter of luxuries we were modest. We took none along but some pipes and five pounds of smoking tobacco. We had two large canteens to carry water in, between stations on the plains, and we also took with us a little shot-bag of silver coin for daily expenses in the way of breakfasts and dinners. By eight o'clock everything was ready, and we were on the other side of the river. We jumped into the stage, the driver cracked his whip, and we bowled away and left the States behind us. It was a superb summer morning, and all the landscape was brilliant with sunshine. There was a freshness and breeziness, too, and an exhilarating sense of emancipation from all sorts of cares and responsibilities that almost made us feel that the years we had spent in the close, hot city, toiling and slaving, had been wasted and thrown away. We were spinning along through Kansas, and in the course of an hour and a half we were fairly abroad on the Great Plains. Just here the land was rolling, a grand sweep of regular elevations and depressions, as far as the eye could reach, like the stately heave and swell of the ocean's bosom after a storm. 
and everywhere were cornfields, accenting with squares of deeper green this limitless expanse of grassy land. But presently this sea upon dry ground was to lose its rolling character and stretch away for seven hundred miles as level as a floor. Our coach was a great swinging and swaying stage of the most sumptuous description, an imposing cradle on wheels. It was drawn by six handsome horses, and by the side of the driver sat the conductor, the legitimate captain of the craft, for it was his business to take charge and care of the mails, baggage, express matter, and passengers. We three were the only passengers this trip. We sat on the back seat, inside. About all the rest of the coach was full of mail-bags, for we had three days delayed mails with us. Almost touching our knees, a perpendicular wall of mail-matter rose up to the roof. There was a great pile of it strapped on top of the stage, and both the fore and hind boots were full. We had twenty-seven hundred pounds of it aboard. The driver said, A little for Brigham and Carson and Frisco, but the heft of it for the engines, which is powerful troublesome, thout they get plenty of truck to read. But as he just then got up a fearful convulsion of his countenance, which was suggestive of a wink being swallowed by an earthquake, we guessed that his remark was intended to be facetious, and to mean that we would unload the most of our mail matter somewhere on the plains, and leave it to the Indians, or whoever wanted it. We changed horses every ten miles, all day long, and fairly flew over the hard, level road. We jumped out and stretched our legs every time the coach stopped, and so the night found us still vivacious and unfatigued. After supper a woman got in, who lived about fifty miles further on, and we three had to take turns at sitting outside with the driver and conductor. Apparently she was not a talkative woman. She would sit there in the gathering twilight, and fasten her steadfast eyes on a mosquito rooting into her arm, and slowly she would raise her other hand till she had got his range, and then she would launch a slap at him that would have jolted a cow and after that she would sit and contemplate the corpse with tranquil satisfaction, for she never missed her mosquito. She was a dead shot at short range. She never removed a carcass, but left them there for bait. I sat by this grim sphinx and watched her kill thirty or forty mosquitoes, watched her, and waited for her to say something, but she never did. So I finally opened the conversation myself. I said, the mosquitoes are pretty bad about here, madam. You bet! What did I understand you to say, madam? You bet! Then she cheered up and faced round and said, Danged if I didn't begin to think you fellers were deef and dumb, I did, begosh. Here I've sought and sought and sought, a bustin' musketeers and wonderin' what was ailin' you. First I thought you was deef and dumb, then I thought you was sick or crazy or something. Then, by and by, I begin to reckon you was a parcel of sickly fools that couldn't think of nothing to say. Where'd you come from? The Sphinx was a Sphinx no more. The fountains of her great deep were broken up, and she reigned the nine parts of speech forty days and forty nights, metaphorically speaking, and buried us under a desolating deluge of trivial gossip that left not a crag or pinnacle of rejoinder projecting above the tossing waste of dislocated grammar and decomposed pronunciation. How we suffered, suffered, suffered! She went on, hour after hour, till I was sorry I ever opened the mosquito question and gave her a start. She never did stop again until she got to her journey's end toward daylight, and then she stirred us up as she was leaving the stage, for we were nodding by that time, and said, "'Now you get out at Cottonwood, you fellers, and lay over a couple days, and I'll be along some time tonight, and if I can do you any good by edging in the word now and then, I'm right thar. Folks'll tell you that I've always been kind of offish and particular for a gal that's raised in the woods, and I am, with a rag-tag and bobtail, and a gal has to be, if she wants to be anything. But when people comes along, which is my equals, I reckon I'm a pretty sociable heifer after all. We resolved not to lay by at Cottonwood. End of chapter 2